Good morning, New Beginnings Church of Life family. We're so glad that you're here. Now, let's prepare our hearts, minds, and bodies to worship Jesus together. Hallelujah, 
I accepted Christ in 1968 while I was still in high school. And I was the only one saved in my family. The only one. The only one. As, actually, when I got saved and went home and told my family, they thought I was weird. I said, what does that mean? You know, I mean, they, they made me really feel like, like that, you know. So I, I really didn't have a whole lot of support. And uh, I finally, when I went into college, um, I, I was still a very young believer. I was very, very young and college life and everything wasn't, wasn't very healthy for me. And I kind of walked away from my faith. But by the end of the, my four years in college, I, it was a phenomenal thing that happened. And I won't go into detail because of time. Um, I uh, rededicated my life to, to Jesus in my fourth year. And then I went straight into the military because I, was, uh, I went to school on ROTC uh, scholarship. So I went straight into the military and still started growing. I was, got baptized in the Holy Spirit at a Catholic renewal meeting in and, and Georgia, in Fort Augusta, Georgia, where I was doing my training. And, uh, El, and uh, it was really, what's that here? Fort Gordon. What did I say? Fort Augusta. <laughs> Fort Gordon. In Augusta. Right, okay. It was Fort Gordon in Augusta. The, you know, it was really weird because, and, and I'm going this way to tell you that one of the, in my spiritual development, I grew in worship faster than I grew in anything else. And, and that was very an interesting thing. And I remember going to a Catholic renewal meeting in Augusta, Georgia, I remember being the only black person there. This is in the suburbs of Augusta, Georgia. Like, what are you doing? But I didn't have any of that. Nobody just didn't ask me that. I felt very welcome, very well received. And then I was the first time I'd been around Catholics. And I had all these stereotypes about Catholics. Oh, yeah, I'd never been in a Catholic gathering. <laughs> I said, how in the world did I get here? <laughs> There's so many reasons why I should not be here. You know, and, and they begin to worship the Lord. And I don't know if any of you remember, I don't know if you, you all remember the Catholic renew, the charismatic renewal meeting, and the song that everybody was singing is Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we, we would sing that 20, 30 minutes. Hallelujah. We would just sing it on and on and on. We never get tired of singing that song, you know. And so in these renewal meetings, they begin to sing that song. And I just felt the goosebumps go up. I said, what is this? You know, it was the spirit of the living God. You know, I didn't know that. I had no idea that this is what it meant to be in the presence of God. All I knew was that that song ushered in something. The atmosphere changed. That's all I knew. So after the training that I had in, in uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, I went straight over to Germany with a little break to serve my first four years in Germany. And I got around some very radical Christians, believers, who were all in the military. We were all young soldiers. Believe it or not, I was in my 20s, early 20s. <laughs> and, 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 and these guys came around me. They heard I was, I was saved. And in the middle of the night, at around 11 o'clock, we'd go up outside of the military base, up on a hill, and we would just worship the Lord. We would just worship with these young soldiers. We would just worship the Lord. We were just radical. I mean, there was one guy who was a Puerto Rican who was a dope dealer who got into the military because they were going to arrest him. They were going to arrest him. They said, unless you go in the military, we're going to arrest you. So he got into the military. And then there was a, a guy who was a hippie in California who did all kinds of weird things. And it was all this mix of people who did all these things that the Lord had saved. The Lord had saved and changed. And, and we would go up into this mountain, you know, these, these young guys, you know, who were in the military for all these different reasons, but we had become together, and we just worshiped the Lord. We just worshiped the Lord, and I felt the Lord was just, and so I love coming here, because that's, I get that same kind of longing and thirsting for God that I had years ago when I was in the, I feel the same thing. And that's why I, I love it here. I love coming here, because there's this, it's this abandoned worship, you know, and that's what it was that we experienced. I was looking at my calendar. The last time I came was uh, in the last October, last Sunday in October, that I, we came and I talked about transitions. And we hadn't had the election yet. We talked about transitions. And when I got the word that, to speak this morning, I realized that, I realized that this is part two of that message. 
This is, this is really part two. Harriet, I left my Bible there. Could you give me that, the Bible there? And so I'm going to talk. It's almost, it's a different, thank you. It's a totally different. Uh, Pastor, I'm going to give you a different book to try. <laughs> see how it comes. <laughs> thank you. And uh, so much has changed. So much has changed. The election and, and uh, things that are happening in the world today. Uh, I knew there, uh, I don't know if you keep up with the news, but uh, things have gotten, you know, really hot in the Middle East again because of what happened um, in Iran with the, uh, the scientist that was assassinated. No one knows who did it, but everybody thinks it's Israel. And all of the political ramifications of all of that. And uh, everything, you know, the COVID-19, how it's sparking and spiking in so many different places. And so uh, the, the, the title of the message this morning is what to do in such a time as this. That's the title of the message. What to do in such a time as this. And... Uh, so I'm going to ask you to turn with me and read from the beginning in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. What to do in such a time as this, with, with so much turmoil and so much anxiety and, uh, and uh, so much despair. Uh, and people are looking into the future and wondering what is the future going to be like with all the changes that are coming about. Beginning with verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar. And he had touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. And so from this passage of Scripture, we're going to talk about what I see as answer to the question, what to do in such a time as this. And so, we're going to look, first of all, at the significance of each of these critical statements that are made. Number one, the death of Uzziah. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. That Let's focus on what does that represent? Well, historically, Uzziah was one of Israel's few good kings. They didn't have a lot of good kings if you studied the history in the Old Testament of Israel, whether you're talking about the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom was the ten tribes and the southern kingdom was the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. They had separated. And between those two countries, historically, they had different kings, but most of them were very wicked kings that led the country, the people of Israel, further and further into idolatry. But Uzziah was one of the few good kings who ruled over Judah in the south. And the Bible says he reigned for 52 years in Jerusalem. He was a king for 52 years. And, he, and the Bible said this, and you need to mark this in your own mind, and I'll give you the verse, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 4. We won't go there. But it says he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Not every king could... You could say that about, historically. But here's 
the important verse to note. In 26, chapter 26, 2 Chronicles, verse 4, it says he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But it says in verse 5, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. So he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. As long as he sought the Lord. Now that's important because that is the key to his success. That is the reason why he was one of the better kings. Because he sought the Lord. And as long as he sought the Lord, God caused him to prosper. God caused him to do well as a king. He, he served for a long time. Uzziah led Judah to victory over all their enemies. They overcame the Philistines. They overcame Arabians. They overcame the Ammonites. And Uzziah was known for greatly empowering his military. He did amazing things. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, again, verse 13 through 15, it says, The army consisted of 307,000, 307,500 men, all elite troops. All elite troops. Can you imagine having an army of 307,000 elite troops? Whether you want to call them uh, the, the Rangers, you know, or, or, the, or the, uh, the Navy SEALs. Having 307,000 Navy SEALs. Wow. But it says they were elite. And they were prepared to assist the king against any enemy. The Bible goes on to say in that same passage of 2 Chronicles 26 that Uzziah provided the entire army with shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, and sling stones. And those days, those were pretty advanced. We couldn't do anything with that in this day, so in this day and age. And it goes on, it says that he built structures on the walls of Jerusalem designed by experts to protect those who shot arrows and who hurled large stones from the towers and the corners of the wall. His fame spread far and wide. For the Lord gave him marvelous help. Hear that? For the Lord gave him marvelous. That's what God, the Word of God says. This was marvelous help. You know, all the things that he built on the towers and the walls. Brother Bill, you were in the military. Can you imagine fighting him, fighting that with those kind of weapons today? <laughs> <laughs> but in, during that day and time, those were marvelous. Marvelous. For the Lord gave him marvelous help, and he became very powerful. But all of Uzziah's success, successes filled him with pride. All of those successes, all the things he was able to accomplish, all the things he was able to attain, all the good things, the great things people were saying about him, how great a king he was, and on and on and on. All of those kudos filled him with pride. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16, it says, Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16 says, But when he had become powerful, Uzziah, when he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord his God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. Uzziah took it upon himself, upon himself, not only to be a king, but he decided, well, I'm so great, I'm so wonderful, I'm going to also be a priest to my people. That's what happened in his thinking. I'm so wonderful, I'm so charismatic, look at the people that love me to death, I'm just going to go ahead and be a priest and I'm going to go into the temple and I'm going to offer incense. I'm going to do this. And what happened is that all of his successes filled him with pride. 
I, I want to suggest, as we look at the question, what to do in such a time as this, the question is, how did we get to where we are today? In 2020, how did, in one year, did we come to a place in our country where there's so much division, there's so much angst, there's so much, you know, everybody is upended. Everybody is going through uh, their own various uh, valley of pain and suffering and hurt. How did we get to this place? Businesses have closed. There, somebody said one out of every six people right now is standing in line because they need food. How did we get to this place? And, and it happened just like that. How did we do that? I'm thinking about how did Uzziah get to a place where God blessed everything that he did, all the marvelous things that God did for him, and just like that, things turned around in his life. I'm not casting judgments. I'm just saying how did we get to the place where everything seemed to be going so well with us as a people, as a nation, and just like that. And I do believe that there was an element where we became very comfortable with ourselves. Very, very as Uzziah. Very self-assured. Self-assured. Overly confident. Thinking there was nothing we could not accomplish because of who we are. And in that presumptuous nature, we stepped outside of the limits and the boundaries of what God says is acceptable, even as Uzziah did. Walking into the temple, thinking now, he took it upon himself not only to be a king, but also to be a priest. And the Bible says pride leads to destruction. And because of what Uzziah tried to do in the temple of the Lord, and, it, and I want you to know that the the, the priests, the men who were the rightful priests, the ones who were rightfully charged by God to do those kinds of services, they immediately confronted Uzziah and said, don't do that. You're going to cause problems for yourself. If you do that, don't. They tried to warn him, but he refused to listen. And as he extended his hand to do what he thought he, he could do, the Bible says the Lord smote him. The Bible said, the Lord struck him with leprosy. Now, don't tell me that God doesn't cause sickness to come on people. I see it there in the Bible. Now, I'm not calling what happened in our country right now, what's going on. God brought that. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying because of the rebellion of this king, he got leprosy. We know that for a fact. The rebellion of this king that he was struck with leprosy. And so, and so he had this disease for the rest of his life. He was quarantined for the rest of his life. You're talking about limited quarantine. My wife and I came from Virginia uh, a, a few weeks ago. We came from Virginia, wasn't it a few weeks ago, I think? A month ago, okay, a month ago we came from Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, November 2nd. Okay, and so we, 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 had to, we had to be quarantined for 14. We didn't have it. We didn't have it, but we had. But can you imagine for the rest of your life being quarantined? For the rest of your life, people are bringing you groceries to the steps, to your front door, bringing you groceries for the rest of your life. But that's exactly what happened to Uzziah. His son had to take responsibility for looking over, uh, taking his responsibility. His son took responsibilities of the king because he, they had to put him in a separate house because of leprosy. And so, eventually Uzziah died. And so I had to give you a little bit of background so you can understand what the death of Uzziah represents. All that I said about Uzziah is a, a background to understand how they got to the place they got to. Uzziah died. And Uzziah represents the loss of something good, 
but not good enough for God. The loss of good in order to focus on God's best. You see, one of the things we need to understand that our good doesn't always measure up to God's best. It doesn't. No matter how well you can do things or how gifted or talented you might be, it, it doesn't always, it's not necessarily measure up to God's best. And what happens, you can walk in this, this, in, in this assuming and presuming that everything is all right with you and, and, and not everything is all right, obviously with Uzziah. Not everything was all right in his, his own assessment of his own life. Because it seemed that everything was going well, then, must, then I must be able to do this and I must be able to do that without asking God, without consulting the Lord, without getting right counsel. And he was counseled, but he rejected it. He rejected the counsel because of his pride. And it instantly, there was no warning. He just said, boom, and God dealt with him. And so Uzziah's death, number one, represents the loss of the good. However, the good was not God's best. The death of Uzziah also represents significant limitations to, of spiritual understanding. It represents we, he was, there was limitations to what he knew about God. What is the world is the king thinking about that you could just walk into the holy place of God, the temple of the Lord? What was he thinking about that you could just walk into that place and just somehow in your own vain thinking that you could perform a ministry that was totally outside of your boundaries? The boundaries that God set for you. What, what, what are you thinking about? You, don't you know God enough that should, should have kept you from trying to do that thing? And yet, at the same time, I know even in our own country that Christians every day, people who call themselves Christian. You know, the majority of people in America still call themselves Christians. The majority of people. And yet, and yet so much is happening around us that if we were a majority as a Christian people, some of the things that are happening today that are an abomination would not happen. Right. Would never have happened. If we indeed were a Christian nation, how could these things continue? How could they go on? How can we call good evil? And how can we call evil good? And yet it happens every day with people who say, I'm a Christian. You see, there's a limitation to understanding who God is and what God represents. And so the death of Uzziah represents a significant limitation of spiritual understanding. Someone said that the greatest limitation that exists in the church today is the limitation of the knowledge of God. Even though we say we're Christians, we don't know the God of Christianity. It is one thing to say that you're a Christian, but it's another thing to, to know the God of Christianity. Who is he? What is he all about? What is his character? What is his nature? What does God love and what does God hate? The prophet Hosea said in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That, that is a significant... My people are being destroyed because they lack knowledge. And another verse, it goes on, it says, because they have rejected knowledge. Why do they lack knowledge? Because they rejected knowledge. They don't know because they didn't want to know. <clears throat> And so I'm talking about the significance and the passing of Uzziah. What does that represent? It represents the death of a limitation of spiritual understanding. In other words, the bar was too low. People just didn't know God. And my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, this is what happens, you see, in a post-Christian era. 
a post-Christian era, which is when a society lacks Christian identity, a society lacks Christian belief, a society lacks Christian practice. That's what post-Christian means. You've heard the term. We are in a post-Christian era. We lack Christian identity. We, we may say we're Christians, but when we look at our practice, it don't look Christian to me. I'm serious. Some of the people that I travel a lot because I'm involved in missions, some people look at me and say, how could you do that in America? Because they knew America to be a, a stronghold of Christianity. But they, they, they see the news. They, they're, on, they're on Facebook. They, they read the internet. They see the stories. They see what's going on. And they say, what has happened to America? All of a sudden, this great nation of ours that was known to certain have beliefs and practices and identity that was not like any other countries because our God... Our trust was in the Lord. In God we trusted. But now we say it, but our practice says something completely different. A post-Christian society is one in which Christianity is no longer the dominant civil religion. But it's a country that has gradually assumed, assumed values and culture and worldviews that are not necessarily Christian. I remember having a president, one president, that said America is no longer a Christian nation. We are a Buddhist nation and a Christian nation and a Hindu nation and a Muslim nation. And then he said, we are an atheist nation. That's what he said. We're no longer a Christian nation. And one moment right there, a king decrees that we are no longer a Christian nation. There it is. And all of a sudden that expresses where we are, a nation that is limited in the knowledge of God. Because now we have decided that it's better to know many gods than the one and true living God. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to go to nbcol-ny.com to connect with us. Or you can find us on Facebook and YouTube. Leave a comment subscribe, and follow us. We would love to hear from you. There are two ways you can partner with us and give. You can go old school by making out your check and mailing it to New Beginnings Church of Life, 202 East Commercial Street, East Rochester, New York, 14445. Or you can go new school and give online at nbcol-ny.com.